so um, we're still trying to figure out the best thing to do. Um, it's funny, one, one of my brothers who would hear me talk about climate change at a weekly get-together we have, would, literally said one day, if, if this is such a big deal and so important, why are you the only one talking about it? And that gets back to the media not doing more and the president, our leaders, not doing more. Well, why is that? I, I think in a, a world where things worked as they should, we would know about it. But getting back to the human nature issue, which is a recurring theme, um, and, and getting back to my background in the business world, it seems like in the past, most business people were willing to choose sides to, in terms of whether they wanted to be conservative or liberal. And um, they weren't trying to unduly influence the government. And, and again, I'm not a great student of history and government, but I, the perception I have is that today, smart business people who have a lot of money have figured out how to influence the government more than in the past with contributions to politicians and with public relations firms and with media like Fox News, which is, you know, everybody thinks it's just another news station, but when you dig deeper, you realize that it's more like a propaganda outlet for the right wing under one of the wealthiest men in the world, Rupert Murdoch, who's recently been in quite a bit of trouble for doing illegal wiretapping to get news. And, and you know, to, to uh, Murdoch, it seems that getting the story and selling papers and amassing more money is his objective. And truth is out the window more and more. And doing the right thing is out the window more and more. And that frustrates me again, growing up in Ohio, and not that that means I'm special in any way, but you, you tend to grow up with all of those American values of, you know, this is a great country, we can work together to solve the problems, let's all do the right thing and everybody will be fine. So when I see uh, things like Fox News continuing to um, talk about things that have happened in the climate arena that have been shown to be um, not an issue, but they continue to talk about the so-called climate gate thing where um, it's in the news, so I won't explain it in any detail, and anybody can look it up, but some emails were stolen and they were sorted through and there were a couple of sentences that looked a little funny and they were taken out of context and in a huge public relations success to, to I, I give credit to it being successful to achieve the objective of trying to discredit the scientists, um, <laughs> Fox News keeps bringing up climate gate that you know this shows the scientists were cheating and they, they ignore the fact that independent boards since then have totally exonerated the scientists. And another point with regard to climate gate is that we're only talking about like 1% of the evidence that supports the whole climate change scenario. It's not as if it were a key point. So the public relations campaign to discredit climate change and call it a hoax and to have our politicians such as uh, leading senator in Oklahoma, Jim, Jim Inhofe, call it a hoax publicly. Um, you trace where the money's coming from, and it's coming from largely fossil fuel interests, and there are public records that document this. So we have politicians who are taking a lot of money from the industry that benefits most from climate change in the sense that they're selling the fossil fuels that we're burning that release the carbon dioxide that are going, is going to the atmosphere to cause the enhanced greenhouse effect and heating up the earth. Those people are basically trying to preserve the status quo, which leaves them sitting on top of the largest and most profitable industry on the planet, which is the fossil fuel business. And 
the irony there is going back to the Harvard Business School background and, and any good business student knows that when you're in a business, you're supposed to not only optimize the short-term profits, but you're supposed to make the company sustainable. That's the, the balancing act. You, you aren't going to uh, be rewarded if the company goes bankrupt. So by all rights, the fossil fuel companies should redefine themselves from being in the petroleum or oil business to being in the energy business. They should be taking the profits they make from the extraction and refining of oil, which is currently at the point where we're at the, the peak amount of production of the known fossil fuel reserves that are clean and um, easily mined and refined to investing in the energy of the future, which is wind and solar, to keep the company going as an energy company. But the human nature part of it is, and I've run into these executives in my travels, is that it's, you know, it, it's just much easier to come into work the next day and keep pursuing the fossil fuels that you've been doing for a long time, you know, do more of it, you know, drill down deeper and at angles and go under the, the deep water, which led to the BP spills in the Gulf Coast, it's easier to do that than to say, okay, we're going to turn ExxonMobil around from being an oil company and we're going to make it an energy company and we're going to develop the energy of the future. I mean, it, there's 10,000 times more energy coming from the sun every day than we use every day. So we just need to capture a very, very small percentage of that energy, and we can develop battery technology to deal with the night and day problem. We can move the energy around the planet if we invest in infrastructure for the, the grid. Uh, all of these problems are solvable, but because it's a lot easier to go to work and continue to be an oil company or to be a, a media executive, we're basically heading down this path where the oil executives and, and the Koch brothers who run the second largest private company on the planet, which is largely in the oil business, are funding politicians, including the Tea Party politicians, who are moving into government and unfortunately pushing our government towards an agenda that is optimizing the short term, continuing the the role of the fossil fuel companies as the leaders, and again, it's wrong, and this is where we need real leadership, such as we saw, you know, when FDR at the time of World War II encouraged the automobile companies to stop making cars. In fact, he didn't encourage them. He, he told them in a nice way, I guess, that you're going to stop making automobiles and you're going to start making airplanes, and, and they complained, and uh, later came around to understanding that it, he was serious and that it was urgent and they doubled the production quota that FDR asked for because it was necessary to defeat um, you know the evil forces that were involved in World War II. Well, we're facing a similar situation today but multiplied by a factor of a hundred because you know the climate is home to seven billion people, not to mention the plants and animals uh, that compose our planet. And we need leadership to recognize the problem. The research has been done. The technology is there. We've got to stop answering the siren call of the money to do whatever the wealthy people say and answer the call of humanity to preserve a livable climate. And I want to say another thing about the climate change issue. Many people, one of the first things they hear is that climate change has happened before. And they, they remember from, I don't know, third grade, oh yeah, I remember there was an ice age. Well, it's true there was climate change before, but people need to do their own research. If, if the president isn't going to give the state of the climate address soon, People should do the research. You can go to Google and any other search engine and read the first 10 articles in depth that come up when you Google climate change or global warming. 
and you'll find for yourself that there it's real and that there, there are problems. But getting back to there's been climate change before, the problem with climate change today is that it's happening roughly a hundred times faster than it happened before. Plus, we have seven billion people on the planet now that we didn't have the last time there was climate change. So, um, I heard a, a meteorologist explain uh, to a, a group at a climate meeting uh, a few years ago that the climate had changed before and that humans adapted then. They, they migrated. You know, our ancestors moved from here to there. And it was actually, in some ways, a good thing because we learned to cope with adversity. Well, to, to say that in 21st century America is incredible because we can't migrate. Uh, where are people going to go? Uh, we're already trying to keep immigrants out of the U.S. And again, things are 100 times faster. That means that plants and animals and humans can't just adapt to the weather and the climate changing. It, it's not at a speed that we can adapt to. But it's still slow enough that you don't notice it because, you know, climate does change slowly. But imagine... Um, going down the highway instead of at 70 miles an hour at 100 times that speed, that would be 7,000 miles an hour. You'd be in big trouble when you came to the first curve, which would be most of New England. You might do this out in Wyoming for a stretch and be fine, but that's literally what we're doing with this climate. We're, we're going 100 times faster. It's so fast from a, a mother nature point of view that trees which you know drop seeds to create new trees are not able to drop their seeds and have the new trees grow up in the same climate zone that they're currently growing in. So if you think about that for a while it means that the plants that are comfortable in a given climatic zone of which there are six or seven as you move from south to north in the United States are finding themselves being, having the climate move north faster than they can move north to stay in the same temperature that they're comfortable with. Uh, it's a little difficult concept to, to understand perhaps, but basically the earth is warming, but it's warming uh, in a way that to, to stay at the same temperature, you need to move either north to, to a, a higher latitude, um, or you need, if you're on a, a, a mountain, you can move to a higher elevation, and those will keep you cooler, because things get cooler as you move towards the poles, or as you move up in elevation. Well, if you imagine every uh, plant and animal on Earth moving to higher elevation or towards the poles, and project that forward, pretty soon you get to the top of the mountain and it, it gets smaller up there, you notice, so there's not much room, and then you go off the peak to stay at the same temperature. Or if you're moving north, and and this is happening with fish in the ocean, for example, all the fish in the ocean can't end up at the North Pole or the South Pole because it gets smaller and smaller as you approach that. And um, I mean, it's just like a thought experiment. You, you can think about it and say, well, that's impossible. We can't all end up at the poles. And um, so, and, and there's not time for, for evolution. Like, uh, even if you could uh, adjust to the area that you're in, evolution is a slow process for, for those who believe in evolution, as I do and most scientists do. Um, so, it's something that can't be uh, set off. Well, don't worry, the climate's changed before and it's changing again. It's changing in a different way, which is not sustainable. And once you get into the science, the, the more you learn about it, the more concerned you get. And this gets back to human nature. If you really want to know how bad things are, um, it's hard to explain how anybody who understood it could remain calm. You, you, you get to the point where you say, you know, my God, <laughs> we need to be doing something and we need to be doing something now. But if you get to be too far that way, people, because of human nature, say, oh, 
you know, stay away from that person because they're obviously really upset and I don't see any reason for them to be upset, so there must be something wrong with them. But that's literally the situation. I mean, the, the fact is that even if we stop burning fossil fuels now, the climate's going to continue getting worse for a while because of all the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. The CO2 is also going into the oceans and acidifying the ocean water. Why is that a problem? Because every organism in the ocean makes a shell from clams to lobsters and beyond can't make a shell when the ocean is too acidic to withdraw calcium from the ocean waters and convert it into calcium carbonate. They basically are dissolving in the ocean. Well, we get a lot of our food as a human population from the oceans. So not only are the fish populations moving and changing the fishing zones, but we're approaching the point where shelled animals won't be able to make shells. Um, the plankton, the, the phytoplankton in the ocean, which generate a whole lot of the oxygen, oxygen that we breathe, are being um, decimated by the ocean acidity and other factors. So oxygen levels are actually being reduced. and. You don't notice it because we can still breathe. You know, some days the air is a little cleaner than others, but the oxygen is still there, uh, so we don't really notice it. But um, it is a problem, and people wonder, well, how do we know it's man-made? Like, it's another common objection. Um, you know, many of the climate deniers, so to speak, are starting to admit that the climate is changing because they see the wild weather and it's getting to the point where it's hard to reject the fact that it's changing. So the next defense that they bring out is, well, how do we know it's man-made? You know, it's always changed. This is just some natural phenomenon. It's the sun. Well, the science is easy to show. It's not the sun. The sun is a factor, but it's a few percent of what's going on. Uh, the greenhouse effect, which is caused by CO2, it's easy to demonstrate that the, the sunlight coming in comes in as visible light, goes right through the CO2 without being affected. And, and then as it, the light hits the earth and uh, a lot of the energy is actually re-radiated to space, but it's at a lower wavelength which gets blocked by the CO2. So the light comes in. In old, without the CO2 being so thick, it would go back out. And there was an energy balance around the planet. So with increased CO2, the light comes in, it tries to bounce out, but a lot of it gets trapped. So we're trapping more heat. It's like the CO2 is a blanket. So we understand that the CO2 is there. And, and this science is so simple that you know, compared to the internet and the things we do in the Defense Department or going to the moon, it's, it's kindergarten science. So then, how do we know the CO2 is from man? That's very easy to calculate again. We know roughly how much fossil fuel we burn because there are numbers that show the amount we mine or extract and refine and sell. And you can do the very simple calculation that the CO2 that we have in the atmosphere, the increase we have, matches up with the amount of fossil fuel we burn. Again, it's a very simple calculation. Uh, there are other things we know. The amount of oxygen that's decreasing matches up very well with the amount of oxygen that's tied up with the carbon when the carbon atom is combined with two oxygen atoms to form carbon dioxide. That's easy to measure. If you want to get more technical, which I don't want to, but people who wonder how do we know, you can do the research yourself. There's something called isotopic uh, chemistry, which you may remember is used for carbon dating. You can measure the amount of carbon-14 in ancient artifacts. And because carbon-14 decays at a certain rate of speed, you can actually calculate how old something is within a certain degree of accuracy by looking at the amount of carbon-14 that's in the artifact. Well, it turns out that fossil fuels, because they've been buried under the earth for 
millions of years, and because the plant and animal matter that made them up 